Good evening, everyone. Welcome to night school. My name is Christina. And I'm Darian. Um, we are Night School, a program of the California Academy of Sciences Nightlife, a weekly in-person program for adults that mixes science, art, and culture every Thursday night in Golden Gate Park. We are its online arm, and we're very happy to be here online with all of you from all over the country. Welcome. Um, <laughs> so first, a little housekeeping, I guess I wanted to welcome Darian to Night School. <laughs> He's uh, a new co-host. Aria, if you have ever, or second time or third time, or if you've been here before, um, she's still here. She's behind the scenes producing, so she says hi to all of you. Um, but to introduce himself, I asked Darian to um, share, well, by way of introduction of himself and tonight's theme, I asked him to bring a couple of his favorite field guides. So Darian, what do you have? to show okay. our fine audience. So Christina, I did recently move across country and mm -hmm. the only books the only books I brought with me to like start my new library were field guides. Um, I'm a birder first and foremost before I'm even like a human person. So of course the Sibley Guide to Birds second edition is um, a staple on my mm -hmm. bookshelf. I couldn't imagine moving without it. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, and yeah, so as you may have gathered, tonight's theme is field guides. We're talking the history of field guides, um, how how you can make a field guide, and how maybe professional naturalist authors and illustrators make field guides. So Darian, can you introduce our three speakers, please? Yes, so we have three phenomenal speakers tonight. Um, to begin, we have Dr. Sarah Sharp. Um, before the internet, before even photography was invented, field guides were a way for people to learn about the world around them. And Dr. Sarah Scharf is a historian who will be discussing botanical field guides' use as scientific tools throughout history. Up next, we have Alicia Diaz, um, who is the field guide coordinator at the Field Museum of National Hi Nat Natural History in Chicago whose work is centered around the production of field guides and the efforts to translate museum science into advances for conservation in the Chicagoland area. Um, and then lastly, we'll finish up our night with John Your Laws, who is a scientific illustrator, a naturalist, and an author who wrote and illustrated the California Academy of Sciences Laws Field Guide to the Sierra Nevada, which is an extremely comprehensive guide to Californian wildlife, and it's regularly used by Academy science scientists. Yeah, and speaking of Academy scientists, Ari is going to drop a link. We actually asked some of um, our scientists what field guides they use, um, and so we compiled them. So you know what you know best in the biz uh, use. Um, anyway, uh, as always, tonight's program is live. We're going to do a Q and A with each presenter after they talk. Um, so drop your questions in the chat at any time, and we'll get to as many as we can. Um, during the Q&A. So without further ado, I want to bring Sarah Sharp to the program. Hi, everybody. Um, so I'm Sarah Scharf. And uh, yes, I have my PhD in the history and philosophy of science and technology. Um, but actually, right now I work at a <laughs> um, cybersecurity startup. So, <laughs> but um, so I'm going to be talking to you about the history of field guides, the development of field guides, where did this technology come from? And that was what I wrote my PhD on. And so if you're here, you've probably seen things like this field guide. This is just uh, one of the ones that I use that I happen to have around. It's, uh, Ontario wildflowers and you know it's a book and it's a size that you can hold and it has entries on different organisms there's usually illustrations there's words there's an index there's other components to it well how did that happen they didn't just appear fully formed so we're going to get into it so uh slides please okay um so yeah what is a field guide 
Oh, right, it's PDFs. I can't make stuff up here. Okay, yeah, so another way to look at what is a field guide is it is a piece of technology that answers a need. And the need is how do you find out more about something when you don't know what it's called? So it helps you kind of get to the name of the thing, right? Um, yeah, like if you see some plant, for instance, and you don't know what it is, you, what would you do, right? You know, so if, if there happens to be someone near you or at the scene who knows more than you do, you could ask that person, you know, even if you're a little kid, hey, mom, what's that? Or hey, dad, what's that? Um, but what if there's no expert around? That's the situation that field guides are designed for. So what a field guide does is it takes what you already know about the thing and allows you to use that information to figure out more about what that is, to actually get a name for it. Because once you have a name for it, you can talk to it. You can talk to other people about it clearly and unambiguously or relatively unambiguously. And um, so there's all kinds of information that you can draw on. Um, you, maybe you know another name for it in another language or in another context, like maybe it's got a different name when it's being cooked with than when it's growing wild or something. You know, can you, if you saw that thing, you're like, oh, well, at least I know it's a plant. I might not know anything else about it, but at least I know it's not an animal, it's a plant or whatever. So, you know, you would compare it to other things. You can look at its parts. You can look at its context. All of this stuff is stuff you would draw on or could draw on. And even if you know basically very little, you could still draw on some of these things like its visual, its smell, whatever it is. So um, I'm gonna be talking about field guides in botany because field guides originated from botany. And part of it was because um, there were just so many plants and the number of plants was recognized to be more than a human mind could handle, even as far back as the 1620s when there were more than 6,000 described species of plants. Now, those species weren't all recognized now as legit species, but they were distinct kinds of things that were described separately. And we're just gonna talk about distinct pieces of information that, you know, this is an information management problem. So, you know, and even if you go like a century later, it's like, oh no, <laughs> we've got more than 10,000 and estimates, you know, if we go another couple decades later, like, ah, you know, the estimated number of plants in the world was seen to be more than 100,000. And, you know, obviously this is more than an individual can memorize. And so there's gotta be other ways to handle that and other ways to communicate about that because plants were the basis of the economy. They were food, they were fodder, they were building material, they were clothing, they were medicine, they were all kinds of things and you needed to know what they were. And this is the age of exploration and people were bringing back plants from all over the world and you needed to know, like, are we talking about the same thing? So, you know, a book about plants could have thousands or tens of thousands of entries, but how do you find information in that book if you don't know the name? Um, so I'm going to really, like, this is brief, so I'm going to just sort of skim over a lot of stuff. But in the end of the 17th century, there were two main guys who were like addressing this in the way that they thought best. And they were John Ray, who wrote in Latin, who was based in England, and um, Joseph Piton de Tournefort, who was writing in France in French. They both covered about 18,000 species in their works. And I've got a page of each of theirs. So you can see how uh, they, they were sort of organized, at least Ray's was in these like curly brackets that went on for pages. You never knew where they stopped or ended or began. Um, there are lots of italics, lots of bolding, all kinds of crazy fonts everywhere. Um, and uh, Tour de Force was like, you can see what it looks like. Um, but the overall structure was kind of haphazard by our standards. You know, they had different categories of plants and they would be like, okay, well, we have trees and we have plants with bell-shaped flowers and we have plants that live in swamps. Well, what if you have a tree that has bell-shaped flowers and that lives in a swamp? Like what of those categories would it fit under? Like, ah, you can't, you know, it's not obvious what's going on. So um, they were kind of awkward to use, but at least they were relatively comprehensive and people were quite familiar with these texts. They were both very popular. Um, Rays in particular was seen as having the best descriptions of plants. He was a very fine botanist and his language was very precise, but he wrote in Latin, which was not, uh, I mean, it was well understood among the elite in multiple countries, but it wasn't the common language of the people, whereas Tournefort wrote in French, which was. So there was like a bit of a difference in who would be using these books, aside from the countries alone. Okay, but the problem that these and many of the ones that followed 
had was you just can't optimize everything at once. It's just not possible. So you couldn't make a book. Can you, you know, can you make a scheme that's easy to use and it keeps all the similar things together and it's comprehensive and it's, you know, portable and all these other qualities that we would want. These guys didn't realize that you can't do this. And so there was like a lot of trash talking going on throughout the whole 18th century. It was like, well, you know, that guy's scheme isn't easy to use or oh, that guy's scheme doesn't keep like with like. The main criticism was when things didn't keep like with like, but if it was hard to use, it didn't matter. It was like, okay, that's a personal failing of yours. It's not like you can't do it all. Like you shouldn't be possible. To, it shouldn't be possible to do it all. They really thought it was possible to do it all. Um, there's a bunch of religious and philosophical reasons why, and but they, they hadn't figured this out. So it was seen as, you know, you would choose your um, master who you would follow and you would be a Ray follower or a tour de four follower or some other guy or whatever. Um, and there were lots of different camps, but not the easiest to identify plants with those books. So along, you know, decades later, along comes Linnaeus, who you've probably heard of. He's most famous today for uh, popularizing the binomial nomenclature, like the Latin two-part names that we use for organisms. But in his time, he was more famous for what is called his sexual system of botany, which was a way of organizing information about plants. And um, unlike Ray's or Tournefort's, you know, by Linnaeus' time, natural history, which is, you know, became biology, was getting more and more into understanding how organisms work. And one thing that they did know about how plants worked at the time was that they had sex and <laughs> they could tell the male and female parts of flowers apart. And so Linnaeus was like, okay, well, I'm gonna make my way of organizing plants based on something that plants actually do. So the sexual system was um, based on counting the number of the sexual parts, the stamens and pistils in the flowers. So this is how he divided up the vegetable kingdom. This is an extreme oversimplification, but so there's, plants, the vegetable kingdom, and then you would divide them into classes according to the number of stamens and orders according to the number of pistils. And then, you know, the genera and species were assembled in a different way. You would look at individual plants. Okay, are they basically the same? Okay, they're a species. You have other species. They're similar to each other. We'll put them into genera. And so you get this sort of situation where you have like so-called artificial classes and orders. They were top down and uh, bottom up or natural. Ugh. Sorry, my computer was going to shut down on me there. Um, natural species in genera. Well, well, obviously there's going to be a problem because we had a top-down scheme and a bottom-up scheme. They don't naturally mesh. There's going to be problems at that interface. And there were. And so here's an example, classic example of stuff that was wrong with the sexual system. So this plant, Valeriana officinalis, common species in Europe, um, valerian. It, this particular species has three stamens. Can you guys see my cursor? And one, and one pistil in each flower. And so Linnaeus put it in uh, class triandria, three stamens, order monogynia, one pistil. And, um, but then, so this is, this is genera plantarum, his first long work on plants, the, the genera of plants. Then within a couple of decades, he already knew way more species of all the plants, including valerian. So here you go, and you try to find in the species plantarum, which was like more granular, looked at the species. <laughs> you got the first two species of Triandria monogynia, and they only have one like anther. Like, what are they doing there? You know, if you were going to actually strictly follow his um, sexual system, they should be in monandria, but they're not. And so people were getting frustrated because, you know, you pick up a plant, you don't know what it is. You look at the, the stamens and pistils, you're trying to figure out what order and class it's in. And it's not where you expect. And the reason it was not where you expect is because you wanted to keep the genera together and keep them natural. So this is a top down, bottom up, not missing uh, problem. Um, and yeah, problem. So it's gotta be a better way because people are getting super frustrated. I like to refer to Linnaeus as the Microsoft of botany because basically this thing is like buggy, but it was like really a juggernaut. It was like comprehensive. Everyone needed to know how to use it, even if they didn't agree with it, even if they preferred something else locally. Okay, so skipping to the end of the 18th century in Paris, we have this dude, Jean-Baptiste de Monet de Labarque, 
Uh, you might know him for his theory of evolution, not by natural selection, but um, I'm not going to talk about that today. Um, instead, we're going to talk about some kind of crazy thing that happened when he was in his late teens, early 20s. A friend of his dared him. This is not a joke. This is for real. A friend of his dared him to write a flora of France in under a year. So he was like, game on. And he like made this basically a, a flora of France but arranged entirely artificially because he was like, why should we have this top down, bottom up mess? We don't need not natural and artificial, um, you know, not combining properly. I'm just gonna go 100% artificial and, um, and that will be make it everything easy to find and the genera, the plants have Latin binomials. And so if you wanna know all the plants, the species in a genus, just look in the index, right? Like you can use this to key out your thing. He didn't use the word key. This is not called a key. The word key didn't even come in until the end of the 19th century. So he called this a an analytical method, but it's a, it's a <laughs> the whole book is one gigantic key, a dichotomous key. And it was super popular. Meanwhile, in another corner of Paris, at the same time, someone else went in a completely different opera, um, different direction. We have Antoine Laurent de Jussieu, who was a, like a really talented botanist, and he embraced the ambiguity. He went entirely natural. And so his book, here we've got Valeriana, and um, he's like, okay, you know, sometimes it has three stamens and sometimes it has one or two and sometimes it has four and, you know, but um, these are the range of things that the, uh, the members of this genus can exhibit. And um, his book was really highly regarded, but you can see here, unlike Lamarck and unlike Tournefort, he wrote in Latin. So it was a very scholarly work and um, the index was crap. So it was like really hard to find stuff in his book. You can see even here someone who owned it, like annotated it so that he could look this up in somewhere else. Anyway, um, so that's how we were in 1789 in botany. Well, 1789 brought a lot of stuff to France other than amazing botanical books like the French Revolution. So French Revolution happens, everything goes to hell. Um, botanical establishment in France actually survived pretty well, but um, basically, major, major societal changes. And when the country started to put itself back together after the revolution, um, the Republic wanted to educate people quickly across the country and send the best people to Paris to sort of advance the nation. And they wanted to get people to learn about economic botany and, and be apothecaries and this and that. And so botany needed to be taught across the whole country in a more formalized way than it had been before. But there was a dearth of, of instructors because of the revolution killed a lot of people. The students who were around had just come through four years of war. They were like starving. They had no Latin background or really body education. And, you know, to bring everybody up to speed really fast was going to require some new approaches. So um, what the teachers did, many teachers independently, I mean, there were many other teachers doing their own thing, but many teachers started to look at books because they couldn't go one on one with the students the way they had in the past. They had to, the students had to do stuff on their own, like just back to the beginning, you know, if the expert's not there, you've got to give the students tools to do this on their own. So they would be like, okay, uh, what do I do? What do I do? Books, grab the books. Which books worked for what? Okay. If you already have some background information, you can go to Tournefort. If you don't, you could use Lamarck or you could use Linnaeus or whatever. It was like, if you have no information, but you have technical terms that you've learned, you can key something out. But if you already know some background information, that's tedious and you're gonna make mistakes and it's gonna be annoying. So might as well go to a place where you look up something that you already know, look like nearby to find like a plant in the same genus or the same order or whatever, and find the information that way. And so they started combining these systems in the same book and then cross-referencing them. And then they started to condense it and do it just for the local region, because why do you need some giant book that has all the species of France when you're only looking at your own region, which in the case of this one was Orléans, which is in the south. This was what I consider to be the first field guide. Uh, that was purpose-built with the three sections. So it has a key at the beginning that this guy designed himself, wasn't taken from somewhere else, a section with the genera in, that he did himself, and then an index, and it has a glossary and so on. And I actually have that book here. Um, so this is my favorite field guide. <laughs> Whoops, that's the prologue. But um, you can see its size. Um, it's not a well-known work, <laughs> and so it was relatively cheap. <laughs> and um, 
you can see that it has the different sections and so on. So um, that's kind of where we are. You can see um, there's cross references also. I want to mention this cross references because in the early part of the 18th century, if you had cross references, people would say you're lazy. Like they didn't like them. The, they, they thought the concept was ugly. People should, were like, this thing should be perfect all in one everywhere, you know. Um, the idea that you had to flip to different sections was anathema, but it became a necessity. And um, this book fully embraced that. So by 1803, this is what you have. Now, this is kind of the end of my talk. I could talk a lot more about illustrations, for instance, or about, you know, how did something like that lead to something like this by naturalist? <laughs> but basically, once you have a structure in place to allow the users to use different aspects of what they already know, and what they have access to in front of them in order to identify a plant, then you're on your way to getting all the kind of subsequent modifications of field guides, because all field guides will have those cross references between sections that um, became part of that whole process uh, during the 18th century. So, and if you wanted to know what that plant was, there you go, the end. <laughs> Thank you so much, Sarah, that was wonderful. Um, we love the idea of kind of like trash talking botanists back in the there day. Was so much. Um, so, <laughs> there was so much. Um, so what, this is a very specific subject area. What got you interested? Um, in um, I actually this? did my undergraduate degree in botany <laughs> with a minor mm -hmm. in English. And um, how did that even happen? <laughs> I'm really interested in um, concepts like how do you find information? Um, mm -hmm. I did my master's on the origin and development of mushroom farming, and that might seem like a really unrelated thing, but like because I really love mycology, but trying to find the information during that process, you know, it was like, I know that people wrote about this, but what did they call mm -hmm. it? I know the information's in the database, but what's the magic word that I need to get it to come up in the index? Mm -hmm. um, and that sort of thought process kind of put me onto this project. Also, I really hate keys. I hated keys with a passion. I was like, this key sucks, this is bad. You know, you have a different conception of how something is and the technical terms are also similar. And like, ah, like, and I love, like, I mean, I have minor in English and I love etymology and it was like, uh -huh. this, doesn't make sense, this is wrong. And you know, why do you suck so much? And then I was like, I actually have a huge respect for them now. It's like, mm -hmm. where did you come from? But yeah. I love, I love the concept of them now. It doesn't mean I love using them. <laughs> right, right. Um, and I know you mentioned that like, oh, I didn't even get to illustrations yet. Cause I think a lot of people in the comments are like, but where are the illustrations? Right. Like I mean, I'm a visual yeah. learner. How did people do it without illustrations? Yeah. They wanted illustrations. They wanted okay. illustrations from the beginning. John Ray, who I mentioned there, he was always saying they'll never be able to have a good field guide until there are illustrations. The problem was the cost. Um, so printing technology, um, during the time period I was talking about, mm -hmm. you had two options for illustrations. There were woodcuts, which were cheap, relatively mm -hmm. cheap, um, but not super detailed and uh, copper plate, which were super detailed and super costly. And the other thing is wood cut, woodcuts could be reproduced on the same page as text, mm -hmm. but copper plates each, like you couldn't reproduce text and copper plate on the same page. Right. So if you wanted right. an illustration, you'd mm -hmm. have to put several illustrations maybe on the same page, but refer to that page. And of course they didn't like that cross-reference thing going on. So, um, <laughs> uh, so the issue was if this is going to be a book that's meant for students, uh, woodcuts weren't uh, detailed enough to convey the information. Like they're sort of artistic. They're not, they're not, they don't provide the level of detail and copper plates were too expensive. So you had coffee table books type things for rich people that had, you know, mm -hmm. something like been hand painted um, copper plate um, engravings, but the books mm -hmm. were students, if they had any illustrations at all, and many of them did actually, although not the one that I have here, it would be an illustration of terms that were in the glossary. So there'd be like a page of leaf shapes or a okay. page of like flower diagrams or something. Mm -hmm. And they would be used to refer to the glossary because they were just so expensive. Um, 
so not until the 19th century, until printing technology changed, it became more automated. You had mm -hmm. tax law changes, you had changes in the price of paper and stuff, especially in the UK, that was like a whole other thing. And then, you know, in the end of the eight, sorry, end of the 19th century, photographs began to be used, but again, the quality and the cost illustrations were better off um, done with the copper plate. Now, for plants that remain true, for birds, for instance, um, the way that people would look at them in the books was very different. And I don't want to get into all that. There's like, <laughs> it, they were very, bird field guides didn't really coalesce till the end of the 19th century. And part of it is the birds don't stay still. And so the earlier bird guides were like, you, you were expected to have a dead bird, basically. So Peterson really revolutionized it in that he was, instead of putting things by how similar they were to each other in a sort of taxonomic sense. I tried to stay away from, away from those words when I was describing these because they didn't have the same concept, even though the natural method was, it kind of easily got subsumed into um, uh, systematics the way we know it now with evolution mm -hmm. by descent. <laughs> um, with variation, you didn't have that concept back then. But uh, with Peterson, he was like, okay, here are the, there's, put together because they're similar, but we have arrows showing how they are different. And that was equivalent in a lot of ways to the key. So um, anyway, there's different tricks for different organisms, but you still can't just jam them all in a book willy nilly. There still needs to be an index. There still needs to be right. you know, glossaries and all this and that. Right, right. Um, yeah, so I, I do, also really love the fact that like cross-reference was like, that's weak, you know? Um, and so somebody in the comments, like you were talking about the challenge of fitting these kind of three main needs um, into one book, like it's impossible, don't feel bad if you can't do it. Um, somebody said, uh, the Purple Fire 13 said, digital field guides could be all three areas of need. Um, so we were just kind of curious to hear your thoughts on how, no, Okay. No, Tell you. talk about talk about that. Why? Because I, I think it's a smartphone <laughs> or a computer or both. I actually mm -hmm. hate using iNaturalist on my phone. I don't oh. see any detail in the illustration illustrations in the photographs to help. Okay. <laughs> not everyone has access to the technology. Mm -hmm. That's a big one, and not everyone has access to the internet, especially consistently, mm -hmm. especially um, in um, isolated regions. Mm -hmm. um, and again, it also depends on the quality of what's being put together. I'm not familiar with the one they mentioned, but like iNaturalist, which is the one I'm most familiar with, it's a combination of um, machine learning and human um, mm -hmm. input. And uh, it's not always great. It's not always self-correcting on a time scale that makes sense for human beings. So um, there's the element of curation and expertise. So. Yeah. So there's a lot of like you can try to make something comprehensive and you can try to make it easy to use and all that. But it's yeah. there are always going to be works in progress. Right. Um, and then one more question. And so um, Deirdre asked, what about similar books in Arabic or Chinese? And so obviously these are all European, Western field guides. Like obviously that's your area of focus, but. Yeah. Can you say anything about? They you know, didn't happen is. until afterwards. Didn't. Sorry. Okay. Sorry, they happened in French and Latin first. I mean, I was looking at stuff in French, Latin, curious. English, and German, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. um, I did sort of dip into like what was available in other countries. And the thing is, the technology happened to develop in these languages. And I, mm -hmm. I didn't, you know, English was like the England, the UK, the English speaking world was like the backwater. The real stuff was happening in French um, mm -hmm. for most of it. Um, <laughs> so that was really fun. I was like living in France for a while, looking at all those, oh, but, yeah. um, and there were a lot of social reasons for that and economic reasons for that. But, um, you know, that's not to say that people weren't identifying plants in other places. They were, but they mm -hmm. weren't doing it on the same scale and mm, the technologies, okay. you know, like, um, necessity is the mother in, of invention. You don't develop technologies that are a pain to use for the small scale, but necessary for the large scale. If you only deal with the small scale. If you only deal with a small scale, you can have your own like homebrew stuff and it might be just fine mm -hmm. for you and your students. But mm -hmm. when you start having to 
do this on a massive scale with people who've had different educational backgrounds and so on, human mind only works in a certain limited number of ways. Mm -hmm. And um, I didn't mention this before because it's getting long, but a lot of the technologies that were developed during the course of the development of field guides yeah. um, were reinvented or co-opted and are still used in computer science today. So um, they had relational databases, like what's a field guide? It's basically a relational database. Um, there were some really crappy hash tables. I don't know if you're familiar with hash tables, but anyway, um, if you know anything about like database management, all these, all these database concepts came about in field guides, but people were trying to do it with text and the human memory. And those things don't work really well. Computer memory works really well because it's got like basically perfect recall. But um, there were like I've written a bunch of stuff on it. It's just so cool. Um, there was all this stuff about punched cards. So like people talk about Charles Babbage and this type of stuff. But for instance, <laughs> Linnaeus invented index cards. There was no standard sizes of paper back then. Like even that stuff had to get in. Uh, and then there uh -huh. was all this stuff about, you know, how do you mechanically get keys to work? So there was a lot of like data wise, it's the same thing when you have a lot of stuff, a lot of data, mm -hmm. doesn't matter what the things are. So um, if you, in, in, in the, you know, until about the late 19th century, people thought there were more plants than there were insects. Okay. And fungi wasn't even on people's radar. So it was like, okay, well, what's the thing that has the most kinds in the world? Well, it's plants. So <laughs> anyway, it happened in plants first. It happened in France first. That's just happened in France. It happened to <laughs> um well and i'm glad you were and they had like tell us about it. The books about medicine for instance that were organized like head to toe oh so funny start with like head lice things that treat head lice and then things that treat toe, toe, toe fungus oh that's good or like oh, books good. according to other um you know other tra traditional to that region ways of organizing stuff but you can't scale that up and have it work right um, well, thank you so much for sharing all your research and your brain and the way you think about this. It was fascinating. <laughs> thank um, you. So thank you so much for being on the program. Um, and up next, we have Alicia Diaz from the Field Museum. Thanks, Sarah. Okay, I think we're live. So um, my name is Alicia Diaz and I I'm a field guides coordinator at the Field Museum, as mentioned. I specifically work at the Keller Action Center, um, which is a team of field museum scientists and educators who conserve natural landscapes while improving quality of life for local people. I uh, work and belong with the conservation tools program within the center, which I will talk a little bit um, about later. And I support the Chicago region and international partners through their field guide development process. And I just want to mention that um, I'm so grateful for being invited and to be able to talk about our awesome field museum field guides. So if we could have the first slide. And before we start, I, I, I do want to acknowledge and honor all of our authors, partner staff uh, who develop field guides and allow us to publish their work. During uh, the pandemic, we have lost many authors and partners, and we hope as a team, um, the field guides initiative team, we hope that their legacy lives through their field guides. And so there's no doubt that field museum field guides have an impact in conservation and education. And today I hope to share with you that they go beyond scientific information and they often share important stories and or they preserve cultural knowledge. Um, and so how did all of this start, right? So field museum scientists saw the need to make smaller versions of the traditional field guide, which is a book, um, as Sarah. Uh, talked about. Um, and they wanted something that uh, was easy to carry, resistant to extreme elements or weather, and um, made at little to no cost. And that's where the Field Museum Field Guides Initiative was born. And that was in 1999. And during these 23 years, we've helped to design field guides and other um, tools aimed at making sense of biodiversity, celebrate cultural um, heritage and accelerate conservation action. 
So first, what is a field museum field guide? A field museum field guide is a free, yes, free, you heard that right, a free and accessible online resource tool um, that's abound with beautiful uh, images and scientific information to help anyone engage with the diversity of nature and culture on our planet. They are smaller than a typical guide um, and they can be laminated for travel or multiple use. And they look like this. And I wanted just to show you, and they typically, scientific information is usually the family and genus and species. And then um, as uh, we have more and more guides, uh, authors tend to put more information like sex or um, habitat. And so um, a guide could be one page. Um, and an example of that is this archived images of snowflakes guide. It's one page, um, or it could be up to 100 pages. Um, and so the Plants of Greenland guide is an example. And this is our largest guide in our collection, and that's 98 pages. A typical guide is 7 to 10 pages. So what is the purpose of our guides? They aid identification of living organisms and cultural material, facilitating research, education, and conservation around the globe. So the main purpose is to aid in the field, communicate scientific results, and educate and engage people of all ages. So who makes these things, right? Well, people around the globe who share with us the love for nature and the urge for conservation. So that includes biologists, community scientists, ecologists, indigenous communities, students, volunteers, and the list goes on, right? And so what makes our initiative unique and successful is that our diverse and interdisciplinary range of local and international partners and authors. So truly anyone can bring a guide to life who uses guides, right? So field museum field guides are used by a wide range of people in very cool ways, including anyone who wants to communicate and promote science. Educators use field guides to teach local ecology. Graduate students may use them to assist in field work or to ID in the lab. Natural resource managers and stakeholders use them to support um, the management of protected areas, and parents, grandparents, caretakers use them to make learning fun. So just so you have an idea, we currently have a little over 1,300 uh, published field guides from 40 countries. We saw an increase of 15% on submissions and 20% increase in overall users and new users on our website last year. Also last year, we had people from 195 countries download guides more than a million times. And that number is huge. And it's been on the rise since 2020. If you notice on our map, the largest concentration of authors and users are from Brazil, Peru, Ecuador, Colombia, and the Chicago region. And that is really no surprise because these regions are where the field museum have deep connections to communities and extensive knowledge and investment in local conservation efforts. We have 94 U.S. guides, and of those guides, we have 86 Chicago guides or guides that focus on Chicago. And in comparison, we have two guides focusing on California. And at the very least, I would like to encourage anybody that is in California or another state in the US to make guides, right? And so you notice that most of my examples will be from the Chicago region because I work closely with those partners. And I also wanna mention that because of the ecology, the title Chicago region often includes Indiana and Wisconsin borders. So the first examples are common spiders of the Chicago region and common summer birds of Chicago. And these are the top uh, downloaded guides for the U.S. And one would ask, why does the spider guide get downloaded so much? Like, why is this liked so much? And we see an increase. Um, we see an increase of this download. It, during spring. And so we asked a few people and sometimes you're just spring cleaning and you want to know what critter's coming out, what spider is coming out of your closet or maybe you're cleaning your backyard. 
The other one that I wanted to talk about is my favorite, which is um, Common Summer Birds of Chicago. We also have a ver version for the winter. And this is one of my favorite guides because I often use it. I go to a local park and it is really exciting to find, um, to ID the birds and um, have a name for what you see every time um, that you take a walk. And I talk about this guide in every presentation. So you'll hear me if you see any um, other presentation that I make that I've mentioned this. Um, the last one is Butterflies of the Bernard's Field Station in Claremont, California. I had to represent California in some way. And so it's color coordinated. It's really lovely. Um, you'll see uh, orange uh, butterflies, white, um, goes into browns, um, yellows, and, and blues. So the following slides are intended to showcase the diversity of guides that we have. I curated a list and I hope you enjoy it and I'll dive more into detail with those guides. And I also encourage you to visit our website and check out the whole collection. And I will, I will have the website at the end of the presentation. Um, and so um, the first two that I want to talk about is really to highlight how wonderful educators are. And so, Clearly, our guides have made a mark in universities and overall education. First example is Urban Birds in the City of Cajamarca, Peru. And the authors teach science courses in Cajamarca University, and they create guides for students. They saw the need to create educational tools like field guides to alleviate the cost of school supply, particular books. And also, and also another thing that we all notice is that we have guides made by students with the support and guidance of educators. We also have grad students, especially from Brazil, but from other countries that create guides based on their research and completion of their thesis. The next guide is a beginner's field guide, and this is part of a um, series of seasonal guides intended to help audiences get to know plants and animals that call Chicagoland home. It has common names, both in Spanish and in English, and their scientific uh, names, too. It includes a section to draw observations, and it's really intended for anyone interested in learning about nature, and it's a great tool for school, in particular um, younger kids um, that are in bilingual environments. And it's something that we promote often um, because of the, the beautiful drawings. Um, Peggy uh, McLamara, our uh, artist in residence, is uh, the, the illustrator. This pairing, for anyone that is a botanical artist or into uh, landscapes or an artist crafter, the first uh, is Paintings of Prairie Environment by Philip Juris. This guide identifies Chicago region plants found in Juris's landscape paintings. The artist gives both personal and artistic narrative for each painting. And it's really beautiful and informative. And it was also used in his exhibition that was held at the Chicago Botanic Garden. I had a chance to go and the descriptive plates that were next to the paintings had a QR code that linked to the guide. On our right, we have natural dyes in the northwest of England, and this was a really big um, hit for um, during our Members' Night event. The Natural Dry, uh, Dyes Project, who developed this guide, was made up of dyers, designers, botanists, plant experts, and photographers. They aim to develop skills and knowledge linked to natural dyes, and also they wanted to raise awareness about the harmful impact of synthetic dies. So in the first page, you'll see a yellow onion. I never thought that a yellow onion could dye um, cloth or yarn, but it's a very interesting guide and it gives you both the, the seed, the plant, the vegetable, um, and then it gives you the yarn or the piece of cloth that dyed and, and the result of, of that process. It's a great guide for um, not just scientists, but crafters, I would say. The next two guides that I wanted to, to talk about really highlight the people behind guides. Arsenal Middle Research Development Center, Dune and Swell Restoration Project Guide is a, a great example. It um, focused on an Indiana project, a restoration, um, a restoration project that restored 10 acres of dune and swell habitat. Over 75% of native plants uh, were found underneath the, that area and was documented. 
The guide includes pictures of the process from concept, uh, conceptualization to working days to the blooming season. What's really great about this is, is this guide is that the author added photos of the people that helped in this project, and it's a nice way to connect the story of restoration. The following guide is Bobian Woods Forest Preserve. This is one of our recently published guides. Bobian Woods Forest Preserve is home to several hundred year old oak trees, high quality prairies, oak savanna, and wetland habitat, and really hundreds of species of native plants and migratory birds. And the area has a rich history as a former farmstead and lo location for the Underground Railroad. The authors, what's really great about this guide is that the authors not only wanted to document three habitats and the plants found there, but they also wanted to highlight the history as well as the environmental leaders um, from the area that protect the local nature, but also advocate for resources for nearby communities. Um, if you notice, um, there's a little strip at the end and talks about all of the environmental leaders, um, and there are about five that um, are highlighted, and they're also authors of the guides. The next two really appropriate and current guides that, that I felt the need to talk about. So as you know, the monarch butterfly was categorized by scientists as endangered recently. And creating monarch habitat in your Midwestern garden teaches people about planting milkweeds, along with learning about the butterfly's life cycle, its journey, and other pollinators. This guide was created in support of the Monarch Community Science Project held by the Field Museum. And it also inspired a sister guide, Selected Insects in Your Midwestern Native Garden, which highlights different groups of insects insects and spiders commonly found in Midwestern garden. And it also includes um, pollinators like wasps, moths, and bees. This guide is really cool because a lot of the images are taken by the participants, which shows a community effort. And I, I absolutely love um, guides that uh, showcase community effort. The next one is Chicago Region Field Guide Taking Action on Climate Change, which illustrates effective action you could take to reduce your climate impact. And this is a very unconventional guide, but it's super important and very useful, um, very easy to carry, and very nice piece to have in a classroom. And so um, I also wanted to mention, we've talked about these guides and all these different um, educational components of components that exist um, to help users understand the scientific um, material. But guides could also have a layer of deep local and cultural knowledge. And these are great examples. The first guide is medicinal plants from La Región Oriental in Paraguay. We have several guides um, focusing on medicinal plants. So it shows a desire to document this important form of local knowledge. Um, and really showcase how that plant is used in that specific region. The next guide documents seeds, plants, and fruits used to make decorative floral rugs to help celebrate a religious festival in Patapan, Michoacan, Mexico. Again, they're great examples of how guides can preserve local and cultural knowledge. And this information is so critical to be passed from one generation to the next. So you've seen all these guides and now you're interested and want to start immediately on your guide. What do you need, right? Well, you need an idea. And so there's a few questions you want to ask. What is the need for this guide? Are there similar guides that exist? Do I need to do some research? Um, have you looked at the guides that already exist in our website, fieldguides.fieldmuseum.org? The second is define your audience and the goal. How will this guide be used? Should it include visuals like maps, habitat images, et cetera? Maybe an introduction will, will give uh, the user more information. The third is sketch your concept. You can draw your concept. You can gather information and organize it, whatever works for you. Do you have high res or high resolution images? Do you have a reliable um, person to identify those images? Is this an opportunity to collaborate with someone else, um, uh, a scientist, another educator, a community leader? The fifth is accurate scientific information. Authors are responsible for having an expert ID this information. 
And finally, go to our website and figure and look at our templates, look at the requirements. We have a frequently asked uh, question section. Um, so I want to plug that um, we have a Facebook account and we often highlight um, the new um, guides that we publish. Um, every so often you'll have a descriptive paragraph talking about a beautiful guide that's just published. And I highly encourage that you go and visit us and like us. And I hope you enjoy this presentation. I could probably talk about it, uh, guides forever. So I'm um, happy to represent the Field uh, Guides Initiative. Um, and so I don't know if anybody has comments, questions. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Alicia. That was phenomenal. Now I want to make a field guide. And I know a lot of our audience echoes that sentiment. Um, we have a lot of great questions. Um, I know you mentioned that the Field Museum does have an illustrator. Uh, Corinne asks, in what cases would an illustration be more useful than a photograph or vice versa? Because a lot of the examples we saw used mainly photographs. Mm -hmm. For the most part, photography is, is the best. Um, if you notice the one that we had, uh, the example that I had, it was really intended to be more kid friendly or family friendly. I've also seen um, guides with um, uh, very precise bird uh, drawings. And I've heard that that is helpful as well. So I think it depends on the, the scientist or the person using it and how what they use to identify the plant, the, the animal. Mm -hmm. So I don't have a, a, a complete <laughs> question. It, it, I mean, answer, it all depends on the person, right? Yeah. Um... Brianna asks, what's the process like for creating or submitting information to a field guide? Um, she's a teacher. She's wondering if the creation of a field guide could be a class project. So not just the completed project uh, tool of a field guide being mm -hmm. the educational tool, like the, the creation right. being an educational opportunity. Sure. So we've, we, we, uh, I wish I had put an example, but if you go to our website, we have a great example of that. Um, uh, a school called uh, Our Lady of the Snow actually had a garden um, installed in, in front of their school and they created as a group, as a school um, with field museum scientists, um, uh, they created a guide that followed their process and their, their garden. Um, the process varies because um, there is no a uh, defined timeline. Um, usually it takes three to six months, but depending on your project, it might take a year, it might take two. Um, what I recommend is always having a lead author or lead on the project and making sure you are working with someone that can identify that. I think it would be a great idea to have it as a uh, school project, but always making sure that the information is accurate um, and documenting the process. I love when guides have people, the people that are involved. And if you have students that are, you know, <laughs> cleaning up a garden space, seating, um, it's a great opportunity to highlight those students and their work and, and their contribution. Yeah, it definitely sounds like a very involved process that's worthy of documentation. Um, Kayla asks, what was the guide with the yarn called again? Oh, yes. The one I said would be popular. Um, it's called uh, Natural Guy. I, I could go back to my. It's called Natural Dyes of West um, West England, but I want to make sure that I give you the proper title. Whoops! It is uh, Natural Dyes in the Northwest of England. Good to know. We'll have to keep our eyes out for that. Um, let's see. Do you? work at all with the Audubon collection of field guides? Um, one person wants to know, can you speak to them? I do not. We publish um, bird guides often, um, but I do not work directly with that department. We do have, so when somebody submits a guide, we, we ask them to have an expert and we do an additional review. And we have um, one of our um, uh, bird experts, uh, Doug Schultz, uh, look at the, the guide and review it. And he always has his binoculars on and he's, oh, he's really busy. Yeah. <laughs> Great. I'm a bird person myself. So 
That's uh, big for me. Um, I guess the last question that we have is a lot of people in the comments seem to be very um, interested in the inclusion of people in field guides with indigenous communities or environmental leaders. I think that's important to like acknowledge that humans are integrally connected to our environment. Uh, do you think that people and culture should more often be included in field guides? And what might that look like? Yes, absolutely. So we have um, a lot of guides that are, you know, biocultural guides where um, we often see how important community members are part, how important community members and their voice are in field guides. And so one of the one of our guides that we typically talk about is um, one from the Shikre tribe, and I might be saying it incorrect, but the Shikwa uh, uh, tribe um, in Brazil, and it has elements of, um, it's a fish guide, and it not only shows um, the fish found in the area, but it also shows like fishing techniques and the community was really involved in the creation of that guide. And so it, it really becomes a labor of love and you want to be able to authentically represent those communities. Um, and so what's the best solution having um, people involved um, and really showing them in the guide uh, through pictures and the process. Thank you so much for your super valuable insight. This has been so amazing to hear about. Um, Alicia, thank you. Um, thank you. So our last presenter of the night uh, who's coming up now is John Yearlaws. Hey, John, you're, you're muted. You gotta unmute yourself. Okay. Uh, the classic online meeting faux pas. Um, so I was just saying, hi, everybody. <laughs> so hi, everybody. Um, I, I have been a, uh, a field guide junkie since a very early age. My dad was more of a botanist, I mean, a, a bird watcher, and my mom was a botanist. So between the two of them, we're constantly just opening up field guides. So I got, I got the bug at an early age. And um, the, uh, I'm gonna share a little screen here. Um, share this, share screen. And um, so, um, hey, that is that's that's me, that little guy right there. Um, and um, this is me with mom up in the Sierra Nevada mountains, and that's me with dad finding some snow plants up in the Sierra Nevada mountains. Um, I got hooked on natural history at a really early age and just never stopped. My only problem though, was that as I would, I would go, the more into it I got, the heavier my backpack would become. And so schlepping all this gear with you on, uh, as, as you bounce through the mountains is, is rough. And so sometimes you'll think to yourself like, okay, I'm just going to bring, maybe I'll just bring my, my, my flower books. So if, if that's what happens, then inevitably there are going to be birds or other sorts of things that you're like, oh, this should have been my bird uh, drawing book. I also, I remember uh, in high school hiking the John Muir Trail and we spent the whole time fantasizing about two things. One was the food that I would eat when I finally came out of the backcountry. The other was I was trying, I was envisioning a, my, my dream field guide, a guide to the, um, to the Sierra Nevada that would make it not necessary for me to schlep with me all these books that I, I had. And then realized at one point that nobody was going to make this book. And so if you sometimes, you know, if you want to get something done, you just got to do it yourself. So um, I left my job at the California Academy of Sciences. I was their manager of field studies. And for the next six years, I had the office with the view. So I went from the basement of the California Academy of Sciences 
to this was my office view. And so throughout the, um, from, from spring as the snow would start to melt through summer and into fall, I would bounce through Sierra fields and with a, 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 a notepad and, and a backpack. And I painted every flower that I found, every tree that I found, every bird that I found. Um, I would document those. And um, it's that brought me just into some exquisite places. Um, this is kind of fun. If you look really carefully right here in this picture, there's a strange little bonus bump. I was out, um, I was out drawing wildflowers. And then as I was sitting there, one of the rocks, one of the pieces of granite next to me started to move. And um, what it was, was this thing. Check that out. So the, the rocks around here are gray and white flecks with red rusty stains. And so here's this bird that's gray and white flecks with red rusty stains. When it was still, it was completely invisible. It actually changes its color in, in wintertime. Um, so that's a little ptarmigan. So I could, uh, you know, either I would, I would bounce from... From, from sketching the, the wildflowers to whatever whatever was cooperative. And then the season would start to change. And in the rainy season, um, before winter would come, I would, um, you know, here's, if you look, there's bear grass sticking out right there. I've kind of got to sketch my bear grass. I was trying to track down all these flowers that, um, that, I, that I had not... Um, I had not observed. And um, eventually, though, the, the snows would come. And it turns out it's really hard to sketch wildflowers underneath snow. So when that would happen, I would bounce back to the California Academy of Sciences and use their extensive scientific collections to get careful careful drawings of all the some specimens like say lizards or or insects i could not i couldn't really do those from the um uh i, I could get quick sketches in the field but um sometimes actually having a specimen in your hand is really kind of the critical thing to kind of get those final detailed drawings and so I used those to draw um, every bird, mammal, reptile, amphibian, star charts, fish, trees, lichens, mammal scat, uh, everything that I could find up in the Sierra Nevada. And that was, that was my life for the next six years. It was... It was mind blowing. So all this time, you know, like if, if you're if you're in a job, like let's say you really like nature, so you end up at the science museum, and then you do well in your job, like you get promoted to some manager position, and then you know, I eventually I found myself just like sitting behind this computer and managing, trying to manage manage people's budgets. I'm dyslexic. I can't manage people's budgets. So, but I was trying to do that. And realized like, you know what? I really need to be out in the field looking at a carmagen. And so that was, that was my job transition. And what I did is I wrote this book. This is a California Academy of Sciences field guide to the, uh, to everything that creeps and crawls in the Sierra Nevada. And because I am dyslexic, um, I don't read the text in most of the books that I have and most of the field guys I have. I love looking at the pictures. So this is just, this is a lot of pictures and a lot more 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 pictures. Ooh, Star Trek, right? Because you spend half your time kind of looking up there like, I knew this last summer. What was that? What was that? Oh, arc to arc tourist. And then what? Is it? So the, um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to bounce over to the, um, a document camera, and we're going to take a look at at how a dyslexic 
organizes a field guide. Actually, first I'll show you some of the original drawings that kind of go into making something like this, because everybody thinks I have really fine hand-eye coordination, because I like these little drawings of insects, but I actually drew them big. Um, so let's let's take a look at this. Here we go. <clears throat> Oop. Ah. Okay, I see that John's camera has disconnected for a second, but he's doing very fancy, fancy camera things. So I'm sure he's going to figure it out. <laughs> but feel free to drop questions in the chat while, while we're waiting for him. I'm sure you have a lot. Very interesting journey to this field guide. <laughs> oh. Jack. <laughs> ah. Okay. See him. Uh, yes. You're back. You, yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, good. Good, good, good. <laughs> All right. Um, so, um, so this, this is, this is a small portion of the paper pile that I, I created. And um, what these are, um, these are the life-size drawings of different critters that I that I observed. So this is a little caddisfly that makes its little case out of stones. Um, and this caddisfly makes a case out of little tiny twigs and builds a log cabin. There's a stone fly. This is a caddisfly that builds a little um, a little uh, snail shell out of pebbles. Right. So these are the life-size drawings. And what I would do is I would put the critter underneath a microscope, make a very careful scientific illustration of it. To save space, I only drew half of the butterflies. Um, so the other half, you know, you just have to, 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 to make up. Um, but you know, so all of these are are drawings of these are done under a microscope. So I'm uh, that's that's what allows me to to enlarge these insects. But um, let's take a look at some of the plants because the plants were a different story. Oh, more insects. These are grasshoppers. Um, so I would try to figure out like what views of something is somebody going to really want to see. Are you plants? Yes, you're plants. All right. So these are, are plants and the plants are all drawn from life in the field. Um, if you pick a plant, it really, it just starts to change right in front of you. So I wasn't even picking these. So I'd set myself down next to the wildflower and make a very careful drawing of it. And I try to draw the angles that I thought would really show the structure of something. So here really showing the three petals, what are the parts inside? Um, with a drawing, you can show aspects of something that are, can actually be hidden and more difficult to see in a photograph. You see, a photograph gives equal weight to every little pixel. But in an illustration, I can lie. I can lie. I can emphasize those things that you need to see or to turn the angle of something at a slightly different angle where it wasn't really pointing out that way. But if I show it at this angle, you can see and understand the structure of it in a way that is really hard to do with a photograph. So that's actually one of the advantages of drawing a picture is that I I actually get to choose what aspects of something I want to show. The other advantage of doing all these drawings from life in the field is that you get to spend a lot of time running around in the Sierra Nevada mountains looking at all of these, these crazy beautiful things. I would also, um, on things like lupin, I also need to include 
um, a dissection of part of the flower because part of how you identify lupins, you actually have to really kind of geek out and kind of get in there and say like, all right, this part has hairs on this surface, but not on this surface. So um, there's, there's also a, a, a strong degree of botanical geeking out going on here. And then I take all of these drawings and I bring these um, back home. I scan each one and I kind of crop it out. So I've got a, a drawing that is a, a, a separate little, little file there. Um, and where did I put my, uh, I put all these drawings on top of my field guide. And so then I um, use desktop publishing software in design to layer all these drawings in to a book um, and, and in a way that I thought would, so I'm trying to put next to each other the things that are sort of the most similar, what are things that people are going to easily confuse with each other, what are the characteristics that you need to know, and you notice I'm kind of doing this show and tell sort of a thing. So I'm going to show you what detail you need to see, but I'm also going to point that out with text. Um, and that's going to really kind of help emphasize those sorts of things. And other things also may be difficult to show in a sketch. For instance, says inner flesh may turn gray when cut. If inner flesh turns reddish as shown um, and it grows under conifers, you have found this other species. Ah, that's cool. All right. So here are cross sections of things. So, you know, here's mushrooms, lichens, um, trees shrubs, wildflowers, right? And how do you how do you go about organizing these things in a way that somebody doesn't have to look through every page? Right? Um, that is that's a big part of doing a project like this. How can you make it possible for somebody who doesn't know, how to identify wildflowers to identify wildflowers. So again, I'm dyslexic. So reading a lot, I want this to happen visually. I want this to happen with pictures. And so here's my approach. You roll up and there's a flower. You go like, okay, there's a flower. I look at the front cover of the book and I see which one's the flower. That's not the flower. That's not the flower. Oh, the flowers are here. So all the flowers are at tabs that have a height at this level. So the flower picture is here with these tabs. All right. Um, and gosh, they're different colors. What could that possibly mean? Well, yeah, the yellow ones are the yellow flowers. The blue ones are the blue flowers. But wait, there's more. Because within each of these sections, the order that the flowers are in, it's not by plant family, right? So you don't need to be a botanist in order to make this work. Um, but usually what people notice is they kind of go like, oh, look, it's a blue flower and it has 10 petals. It's, a, it's an orange flower, it's got four petals. So people will notice the number of petals and what color it is. So I organize the book by what color it is and the number of petals. So they're all organized this way. So things that are bilaterally symmetrical are all together in a group with this little symbol. I don't know if you can see that symbol. Let's see if we can come on down here. Weep, weep little symbol there. Um, things that are so clumpy that you can't count petals have this little symbol. And then if it's three, four, five, six, or many petaled. So um, let's say you roll up and there is a, um, there's a, there's a blue flower with five petals. What I do is I go flowers, blue tab, and I'm gonna look at the corner. There's three, there's five petals. There's five petaled blue flowers back up on that, whoop, whoop, right? And then I'm gonna turn a few pages and there are all of my five petal blue flowers next to each other. And I've intentionally put the ones that are easily confused with each other adjacent to each other. So what are the adjacencies that you're gonna have um, that are gonna help you identify things? All of those little things go into how you do it. So at the start of each section, here's a little thing explaining how the insect section is organized. There is, um, you know, like you can't really organize the mammals by color 
because there would just be a big, a big brown section, right? Um, but but I did it by size. Like so, if it's really big, it'll be in the big mammals. If they're medium sized, like your house cat, right? They're about this size, and then if they're small, they're small. For most things, I'm not putting in range maps, um, but for some things like these chipmunks, did you know that the Sierra Nevada is the worldwide hub of chipmunk diversity? What? Right? So it is really, really cool. And so there are like all these lots and lots of, of, of uh, for most things you don't need, um, you don't need range maps, but for things like those chipmunks, it really, really helps because there's these chipmunks and all the chipmunks look the same. You know, they've got these weird characteristics. Like, is is there a white patch behind the the, the ear? Like, some of them are like they'll have really kind of clear things, but but some of them they they look really similar. So those range maps end up being really useful. And so um, that was. It was really interesting to try to figure out what, like, you know, here are the paramiscus mice, the this one kind of group of kind of closely related mice. But you see that they've got different different ranges, and then I'm so show, so I'm I had to figure out like how do you how do you show um, range overlap? Um, how do you? Um, so I've got little keys to to those sorts of things. It was really fun. It was a, just a neat project in in divergent thinking. How do like what do you need to notice in order to be able to tell these different things apart? And ooh, animal poo. Um, and of course you have to have star charts, right? Because I mean the stars are so magnificent up there in the Sierra Nevada. Um, that was um, and the green line that is the ecliptic so if you're you're, you're seeing a uh, if you're out there and there's a really bright object and it's on that green line but it doesn't correspond with any star that you're seeing you have found a planet and i've got when you find meteor showers um just so i'm thinking like what are things that are going to be useful useful bits of information um for people this was so much fun to do. Um, a real opportunity to, to play, to explore, and then try to explain things. A little bit of neat natural history information on, on each page. So trying to think of just a few little nuggets of natural history that, so as you kind of go through these, you know, you'll be learning about different strategies that different plants do um, to or or that different animals to um, like did you know that boa constrictors have vestigial hips that you can see on them you can see on the males they've got these little spurs you look right down next to the little place where it poops and there's these little these little spurs those are vestigial hind limbs on the on the on the rubber boa so cool male only oh so much fun. So that is my project, making a, a field guide to the natural history of the Sierra Nevada. So part of it, the project is how do you collect the images? How do you then organize them in a way that people can, can access those? Um, and, and what is the information that people are really kind of dying to know? Um, the, <clears throat> my, uh, my, my, my big claim to fame <laughs> is that a friend of mine who's a, a, a ranger in Yosemite um, sent me a photograph a few years ago. Um, E.O. Wilson visited um, the Yosemite National Park. And um, my friend took a, a photograph of, of E.O. Wilson, one of my just favorite, brilliant uh, thinkers. And um, if you look, uh, this, this much of my field guide is sticking out of his jacket pocket. So that made me really happy. Uh, so endorsed by E.O. Wilson, um, there you have it. That is, uh, um, that is my 
um, the Laws Field Guide to the Sierra Nevada. Um, I, I am, uh, I have another project that is brewing, another field guide project where I'm slowly collecting these uh, drawings. I want to make a field guide to the coast range of California, the northern coast range. Um, but it turns out that if you're a daddy, you can't disappear to the mountains for the next seven years and 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 draw everything. So it's going to take um, a much longer time. But I'm hoping that sometime before I am actively decomposing, I will um, complete that book. Um, but uh, you know, just natural history is so much more fun. And also, just mad shout out to um, the, the field museum for the, the work that you're doing, connecting people with natural history and biodiversity. I think that that stuff that you showed is just is absolutely wonderful. Really, really, really exciting work. Um, so, um, would love to take any questions from folks about parts of this process that you're curious about. Hey, Jack. Amazing. Uh, people are very curious. Um, a lot of questions. So, here we go. Um, so basic question. I think you get this a lot. What, I mean, it looks like watercolors, but what, um, what medium do you use? Does it depend on what kind of specimen or what you're drawing? Why that medium? Um, so I need a medium that is portable mm -hmm. and I can get really familiar with. Um, so I use watercolor. This is my watercolor kit that I use both in the studio also when I'm painting at the Academy of Sciences and when I'm painting in the field. So it's a watercolor palette. Watercolor dries really, really fast. And at, when you first start using watercolor, it's kind of uncontrollable. Mm -hmm. But um, if you, um, if you, once you kind of get used to the way that it works, you can let a layer of paint dry. And then when you paint over that, it's not, it's not going bleh out into everything. So it ends up being a very useful media for, for illustration. So those are, those are, I start with a graphite pencil drawing mm -hmm. and that gives me kind of crisp, precise details. I then put watercolor over that. And sometimes I'll take a little bit of a white pencil and just put a few little highlights in with that white pencil. You can do that once the watercolor is dry. That works really well. And is that also helpful? Like what you mentioned going back to the Academy's collections and just, would you just kind of layer on top of the drawings you made in the field? How did that yes. process work? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, so the, the Academy of Sciences has, a lot of people think of it as this, it's this science museum and you go and you see exhibits. Oh, no, you see, <laughs> That's the skin on the outside, and the heart of it inside is all of the scientists and the collections of biodiversity that they have created, collected from all over the world. And so, so several things. One is I can go in, I can pull up on, on the database that they have, what are the most common insects in the Sierra Nevada? And here, brrr, here they come out of the collection. Then I go to this case, I pull out this pin, I go to this case, I pull out this pin, right? And put those little beasties under my, but it can also, the other thing that the Academy of Sciences has is the people who made those collections, the scientists, that's the real gold, is the brains in these folks are crazy. So I will sit down with them and I'll say like, all right, um, here are my illustrations of the birds. Take a look at these. And, you know, they go like, okay, yes. Right. Um, the leg color on this, the tarsus here, that's a little bit, they're more of a gray, aren't they? Mm. I think so. I mean, like the, 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 the specificity of the kind of feedback I could get about, like, and I made all sorts of rookie mistakes. <laughs> I was, I was drawing, I was, I was painting some of these horse flies, right? Because I'm painting, and I was a very careful drawing of the horse fly. And so it turns out, so live horseflies mm -hmm. have beautiful rainbow eyes. They have rainbow eyes. But when they're dead, they turn gray. And so um, the, 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 the scientist looked at it and said, that's a beautiful drawing of a horsefly. 
but it's a dead horsefly. <gasps> you need to go and look at one and look at the what is the order of the rainbow colors in the eyes, right? Wow. Who knows this stuff? They do. It's I mean, just so so incredible the the depth and the beauty of the, the 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 deep knowledge of all these things and there's also fun for that because like oh like you want to really geek out on aquatic insects let's go there <laughs> <laughs> um we have a lot of aquatic insects now yeah, yeah. um and so uh yeah it it, it was it, it was it was incredible so you can i can i can touch those things up mm -hmm. um, and so it's not like I, I, I had to make it really clear because at first I, they, they didn't want to hurt my feelings. Like this little guy's going, I do all these bugs. Do you like my bugs? And like, yeah, I like your bugs. Those are nice bugs. But what I really want them to say is like, no, that's a dead horse fly. You need to paint rainbow eyes. Yeah. Right? Mm. That's amazing. I'm just thinking about like, what, what if you brought your insects to them? And they're like, well, no, this one actually has like rainbow wings and like, I don't know. I'm just imagining like all these amazing char characters. Anyway, um, so okay. On that note, Sarah, who presented earlier, she wanted to ask which organisms were the most difficult to illustrate or organize, um, and or organize. So, so there, 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 there are some fun things that were hard to find. Like a great gray owl was hid from me my entire time i had to draw my great gray owl from photographs and mm. i couldn't I, I go to like the, the all these meadows where the great gray owl is supposed to show up no uh -uh. Mm -hmm. and then finally when the book was published um a, a friend of mine uh invited me over to stay in his yurt and sent me out in the morning and said like i think you just might want to go for a walk down the edge of the meadow great gray owl feeding on the top of these little short conifers in the middle of the bed. Oh, the, the wolverine, that's another neat one. So the um, wolverine sightings were kind of looked at kind of sort of like Bigfoot sightings. Um, <laughs> kind of like, yeah, you saw wolverine in the Sierra Nevada. Sure. Uh -huh. Sure, mm -hmm. sure. And <laughs> the... Um, um, but, you know, there were some sightings by people who really had street cred, like backcountry rangers who knew what a marmot looked like, right? Like, that's not a marmot. Right? <laughs> that is not a pine marten. That is not a fisher. And some of these people would, would describe these things. And some of the people, some of these descriptions came back, I mean, with, with like, where, where the people would make a little sketch of it and how big it is next to the boulder, and then would go up after it leaves, measure the boulder, but you know, there was no, there wasn't, there wasn't the hard evidence that it was there. Right. So I included it in my field guide with a little caveat. Um, and what I wrote is, I'll read it to you because it's kind of poignant. Um, here we go, um, page 309. It says, probably extirpated. But if seen, photograph and report the sighting to the California Department of Fish and Game. So there's your there's your Wolverine. Right, uh -huh. right. Whoops, no, no, nah, right there. Uh, no, yeah. And so within a month of the field guide being published, um, there was a, a woman who was doing the study on on fishers in the Sierra Nevada. Um, mm -hmm. another it's an arboreal mammal. She had all these um all of these traps, these these camera traps out on trees, and you put bait on the tree, and huh. and um, and then you'd go back and and sort of look through these 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 pictures. And uh, she had a, a graduate student working for her, and who was kind of going through the pictures and going, like, "Pine Martin, this is a this is a chicory, this is a what is that? What?" what? showed her the, the the picture she just fell out of her chair it was the backside of a wolverine photographed in the sierra nevada so then the question is like is this a wolverine that has been hiding uh -huh. right 
because we, we thought that we had killed the last Wolverine. Actually, Joseph Grinnell from mm. Berkeley may have been responsible for the death of the last Wolverine um, breeding pair in the Sierra Nevada. Um, in During the Grinnell surveys, they caught a Wolverine. And in those days, you catch yourself a Wolverine, you're collecting the skull and the skin. Mm. Right? Mm -hmm. um, so they collected the Wolverine. And the next day, they caught its mate. And those skulls and skins are preserved mm -hmm. forever um, at the Museum of Vertebrate Zoology. And I looked at those skins to make my, my, my study. So is mm -hmm. this a Wolverine that has been hiding from all the biologists? They're very secretive. But are they that good? Or is this a Wolverine who has come from a totally different area to bring wildness, to rewild our Sierra Nevada? And so once this, this picture was out, like every available graduate student was sent with a little Ziploc baggie out to kind of run around <laughs> near Nevada, trying to look for some scat or like, mm -hmm. like they, they put these little things on trees with, with to, to try to get it to, to scratch up against these things and collect, like, like we got to get some, just some hairs and you could get the DNA off of these things. And um, so they did, they were able to get some scat of this thing and analyze the DNA of it. And here's the story. This is a Wolverine. Mm -hmm. It's walked all the way from the Sawtooth Mountains of Idaho. Wow. We wild the Sierra Nevada with Wolverine essence. And so past um, freeways, cities, all those obstacles, fences, got around all those obstacles and made it to the Sierra Nevada. I mean, that isn't that Incredible. testimonial to just the power of, of, of nature. I mean, that's, that's amazing. That's so inspiring. So yeah, there's, there's a wolf. There's, there's now, and there's, look, um, I'm starting to kind of work on a second edition. Ah. Right? <laughs> because, like, we've now got wolves. <laughs> right? We've got wolves. There's a documented wolverine, and we've got wolves in the Sierra Nevada. Oh, oh man. See, when I wrote this book, that wasn't even on my radar. Ah, mm -hmm. oh, but. Oh, isn't that wonderful? It's wonderful. Um, yeah, when was this? When did you work on this? Because you mentioned seven years you were yeah, out there. Um, so started in 2001. Okay. Yeah. Um, so shortly um, after September 11th. Headed into the mountains. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, this is cre incredible and thank you for that amazing story. And I think, you know, I think after this night, a lot of people are just like, oh, I just want to get out there. I want to create my own field guide for the field museum. Like I want to go out and do some nature journaling. Um, so yeah, so thank you so much for presenting. And um, I know that you have your own YouTube channel if you want to plug that, because I think people yeah. probably want to hear <laughs> and learn more from you plug my, my youtube channel but, but here's the thing like paying attention to nature yes changes your life and the best tool mm -hmm. that we have to be able to do that the best tool every scientist at the academy of sciences uses this tool it's a journal we keep journals mm -hmm. of all of our notes and our observations every one of them keeps a journal the reason is because it works and um so i teach free online classes on how to be your own naturalist, how to keep your own field journal. Um, today, I taught a free class on drawing birds online. And um, the recordings of all these classes are in free archives on my website. And um, what I'm um, essentially doing is that this, this, is, a, this is a journal, um, a field journal of observations. And um, you know, it's, it's maps, it's diagrams, it's sketches of things, it's written notes of, 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 of what you see. 
And you can learn how to do this. Yeah. And um, the tools for entry are inexpensive. Um, all these workshops that I, I teach, it's it's free. So if you go to johnmirlaws.com, um, I can teach you how to how to nature journaling, uh, do nature journaling, and it's fun. Um, there's a really wonderful community of people uh, doing this now across the world. Um, we're sharing ideas with each other, and um, so you can. The one thing is the field guide, but if you, let's say you don't have the field guide, but you've got your own journal. You see something cool. You can document what you see. You can look it up later. Um, and it's different than taking a photograph um, because this is a process that gets you to look again and look again and look again and really observe what is there in a different way. So if you want to get more information about that, I'd say check out johnmirlaws.com. And I've got... If you go into my blog, I've got video archives of all these different free classes that I've done. There's no paywall, it's all accessible. And um, I would like to encourage everybody to do that. We also have our um, a Wild Wonder Nature Journaling Conference coming up in September. And if sure. it sounds like fun, you ought to check that out. It's gonna be really good. We've, I've brought in some of the most amazing nature journalers that I've found to teach. We've got 30 different teachers wow. um, sharing all of their, 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 their strategies and techniques. Yeah, that's fantastic. Um, thank you so, so much, Jack, for being on our program. Um, really, really loved having you on and, and seeing your work. Well, I, I'm delighted to be here. You know, I'm an old school California yeah. sciences kid, right? I grew up wandering through the old building. Um, I worked for years in the education department of the California Academy of Sciences. And so, you know, doing something in, in association with the Academy is really fun for me. I mean, if you even look on the book, look at that. Yeah. Academy of Sciences, go team. Yeah. And um, I'll, I'll say it again. I said this at the top of the program, but we actually asked some of our scientists um, who are out in the field working on um, projects in California, what field guides they use. So um, Ari can drop the link again, but like if you want to go tide pooling, their favorite books for tide pooling. If you want to go to Sierra Nevada, bring jo bring Jack's book. Um, but there's a bunch of really cool <laughs> um, recommendations in there from people who are using the guide when they go out and do science. So Great. yeah. Um, okay, well, thanks so much again, Jack. And I'm going to bring back Darian to close out the program. Hey, pleasure talking with you, Christina. Thanks. Yeah, have a good night. Oh, we would love to say just a massive thank you to all of our phenomenal speakers, Sarah, Alicia, and Jack. Um, Mind-boggling. It's so wild. I love yeah. listening to you guys. <laughs> yeah, and um, I really hope some of you who showed interest in making a f your own field guide and going out and doing more nature journaling, do it, um, paying attention. Like I love what Jack said, just like paying attention. That's it's go out, pay attention, draw something. It, it really changes you the way you look at the world and move through it. Um, and so night school, we're back coming to you the first and third Thursdays of every month. Um, August 18th, we are going to talk about how animals navigate in this crazy world without Google Maps, how do they do it? Um, so so we're going to talk about a few species who use like really cool ways to to figure out how to get around. Yeah, we're all really looking forward to that. Until then, you can subscribe to the California Academy of Sciences YouTube channel so that you'll be notified every time the night school is in session. Um, and then recordings of every night school stay on our YouTube page immediately after we finish here. So you can rewatch today's program right away if you want. I know a lot of people are really looking forward to doing that. Um, <laughs> so don't worry, you can. Um, yeah, you can rewatch all of our backlog of old episodes um, and then keep track of us while we up create new ones. Awesome. Well, um, thanks so much, everyone. Thank you, Darian, on, on co-hosting your first night school. And we'll see you all on August 18th. Good night. Good night.